meditation had impacted me so much that I knew I had to do something about getting this available to the world. And it just became such a strong drive in me, an impulse within me to share what I'd discovered by going down that rabbit hole of spirituality and Eastern philosophy and meditation. The one thing that really captivated me was this word that they used to describe and it was called transcending. Now, prior to me learning meditation, I was doing a lot of recreational drug use and that was for the purpose of escaping my current experience and to transcend. I wanted to be in a rave culture with lots of music and flashing lights and lots of people feeling lots of love and have this euphoric experience. And that's what I was transcending my outer world reality to have this new experience. So that led to a lot of anxiety, depression and side effects. But when I heard this meditation called a transcendental meditation, there was something that really captivated me with that. I love this idea of going beyond, which is what transcend means, to go beyond. And I was curious as to what I was going to go beyond too. But when I started to meditate, this transcendent experience was so profound. And so it might even be just glimpses into something, but to transcend means to go beyond our physical, mental and emotional body. We identify with the world through those three vessels or vehicles, physical, mental and emotional, and that's the I that we identify with. But in meditation, when we transcend that I, we access a fourth experience, which is in Sanskrit called Turiya, and that's the experience of me without an I. And that's this beautiful awareness of peace and calm, but without a thinking and feeling body, which is quite unique. Welcome to the Awakening Entrepreneur Podcast. This show is for entrepreneurs. They have chosen to define their life beyond the material. They have followed their soul on a hero's journey towards the mystery of the spiritual. I'm your host, Garrett Moon. Each episode will be learning from awakened entrepreneurs and spiritual thought leaders. They have broken through the mold of being ordinary to extraordinary, challenging our paradigm, shining lights to the dark, giving hope when there is doubt. The moment of truth is upon us. It is time to transcend our world from fear to love. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to this week's episode of Awakening Entrepreneur Podcast. So this is our second live podcast we've done. When I say live, live in person is no longer over the internet. And I'm very grateful my good friend Tom Cronin have spared his time to hold this session. If you don't know Tom, Tom is a global leader in meditation teacher and he's got a film out and ready for internet launch called The Portal, which we will talk a bit about. But Tom is also a great transformational coach as well. What I really like about him is his um, interesting background. It's similar to like the Wolf of Wall Street, but not to completely draw you to the wrong train of thoughts. Like he came from the financial sector, which is uh, he will describe more about. But how he transcended that, how he reinvented himself time and time again. And he's just such a down-to-earth, humble person, but yet have gone through so much of the deeper, darker, shadowy stuff that a lot of us are facing. And so uh, he's helped a lot of people um, navigate that journey. And thank you so much for um, coming on the show today, bro. It's good to be here, man. Thanks for uh, inviting me on. So um, for the people that don't know your story, tell us like where you grew up and how do you get into the financial sector and how do you become a meditation teacher? It's a big journey there, isn't it? So I grew up on a really small country farm in a really small country town called Thilme outside of Sydney. And it was a really wholesome childhood, you know, riding bikes through the bush and building cubby houses and just traversing in and out of bushland. You know, it was very remote and it was just a beautiful upbringing, very simple. Uh, I was one of five children, so seven in the family. Mum and dad still live in that house and it's, I still go down there regularly to visit them, which is really beautiful. When I left school, I was literally going to go and do a degree in journalism at Macquarie University. And I really wanted to be a writer and write articles for Time magazine and save the world from capitalistic greed. It was really interesting that mm. that was my vision. I was reading books by Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus as I backpacked around Europe after a gap year from school. And when I came back, I'd blown all my money and I had to make some money before my degree started. 
And so I just applied for a bunch of jobs in the paper. It was very random. And interestingly how we have these sliding doors moments. I was offered a few jobs and one of them that I took was on this very exciting, big, dramatic trading room floor. And it was, it gave me shivers when I saw Wolf of Wall Street because it was 1987. And that was the year Jordan Belfort from Wolf of Wall Street started his career. And he was 22 and I was 19 after taking a year off school. And it was so accurately portrayed what a massive trading room floor was like in the late 80s. It was very accurately portrayed. And that's what I walked into. Now, I was going to leave after a short period of time. I had only a few months to make some money. And then I, I didn't tell them. It was a bit sneaky. I was going to leave the job after I made some money and go and do my university degree. Um, because I just needed to get some money in the door. By the time it came around for me to go to university, I was actually really good at the job and it was really exciting. It was just lots of money. It was fast paced. It was, they gave me a big bonus after my sort of probation and I was kind of hooked in, but I still had in the back of mind that I was just going to do one more year and make a little bit more money. And then one year passed and I got a big bonus and I was doing even better and I had more clients and the industry was out of control. It was so booming and we're all making so much money and there was lots of crazy stuff going on late eighties. There was no HR departments to regulate anything. And every year passed with this intention that I was going to leave. And I never ever foresaw myself having a long career in finance. I'd never wanted to do a broken career. I richly wanted to write articles about wow. capitalistic greed in the time magazine. And here I was working in the finance industry, becoming one of those people that I was going to write about. It was just a wild situation. And as the years went by, I found myself being pulled further and further when I look back now away from my truth, away from what was really the Dharma, the path that I was meant to be on. And that showed up in my own experience of life. I started getting a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, a lot of panic attacks. These extreme panic attacks was very debilitating, chronic insomnia. And I always now as a coach and a meditation, I get excited by my students because if they've got ailments, if they've got discomfort, if they've got some disease of some sort, it's the universe really from a loving perspective trying to guide us on our journey to waking, to waking up, to realizing what this is all about. And I was very distracted. And the universe is kind of like, it's loving and kind, but it's not always nice. And even for me as a parent, I'm loving and kind. I'm not always nice. Sometimes I have to be a little bit disciplinarian to support from love and kindness, my children on their journey. And the same thing with the universe. I really started to develop a strong now relationship with the universe and realize how loving and kind it is, but how sometimes it's not so nice. And it wasn't so nice for me then, but that was a good reason why it wasn't being nice because I needed some encouragement to start moving away from the life that I was living. And that's when I started to learn to meditate. And that was quite transformational. And interestingly, I didn't leave the job. I mean, I, that was 10 years into the career. I had a nervous breakdown. It was quite extreme. It was really on the edge of whether I wanted to continue on with life. It was very dark and very challenging at that point in my life. But that's when in the darkest moment of my life, I turned towards the light and I started to learn to meditate. And it was like this epiphany. It was like everything that I'd been looking for in my life. I was starting to find in that process. Now, I want to clarify, I didn't become an immediate monk and beautifully enlightened and perfect human being. I was just the very early stages of me starting to realize there was another possibility for who I am. And I went on that path for many years, but I stayed as a broker. I kept working as a broker, but I dropped all the drinking and the drugs and basically was meditating and using meditation as a stress management tool. And then it was only after 26 years in that career that meditation had impacted me so much that I knew that uh, I had to do something. It became choiceless. I knew I had to do something about getting this available to the world. And it just became such a strong drive in me, an impulse within me to share what I'd discovered by going down that rabbit hole of spirituality and Eastern philosophy and meditation. Wow, thank you for sharing that. So if we can just, I guess, go back a little bit, like what do you think was that sucked you into the rabbit hole or the addictive nature? Because it was a system that you were going through journalism, brain down, but yet it was captivating enough to really draw you in. Like on a the surface, there, there's the partying, there's the lifestyle, like and that comes with the money and the culture they've set up. But what are the essence of you think that really captivate not just you, but a lot of other people as well, not just in finance, but in mm. modern day um, mm. capitalistic society? It's, it's a great question. It, it's exactly that. It's the same thing that pulled me into that rabbit hole. 
that is pulling pretty much 99% of the world's population right now into shopping malls, into eBay, into Amazon, into going to the local bar if they can get to a bar during COVID. But this natural pull towards finding the most rapid experience of fulfillment. So the analogy I like to use to explain this is that cows know naturally to eat grass. However, if we put a big sugar block in the middle of a paddock and we just left it there, before long, even though the cows know what's inherently right for them and know inherently what's good for them, they'll move towards something more pleasurable, even though they might detect possibly that it might not be good for them. Mm -hmm. Whether they do or don't, they'll still go for the sugar block and they'll be licking that thing all day long um, because it just is good. It tastes so good and we want pleasure. We want as fast as pleasure or as possible. And so this is what drives us to, we've developed a society now where we can access pleasure so rapidly. If you go back a thousand years, a hundred years, you'll see pleasure and charm and enjoyment wasn't on hand like it is today. Mm. You know, we, we can get turmeric chai lattes and we can scroll through Instagram and we can go and order something online. We can get Uber Eats to our house. We get pleasure so readily and it comes as at a big price. And if you look at the tribal cultures, the spiritual practice cultures, if you look at the religious backgrounds where they willingly forego pleasure in the short term for something deeper and more sustainable, then we find deeper levels of happiness in those cultures. But for me in, in that industry, uh, particularly, it was just on tap all day long. And the universe is really good at letting us know if we're not seeking pleasure in a sustainable place. Mm. It does that time and time again if we're distracted and the universe is very good at reminding us things. Mm. What are some of the examples of the ancient cultures where they forego some of the immediate uh, pleasure? Yeah, it's a great question. So in the Christian, I was brought up Catholic. So in Catholic tradition, we have Lent where we would forego things for 40 days before Easter. But even then, you know, within, uh, sorry, beyond Lent, we have things like on a Sunday morning, we would go to church and we would forego a big bacon and egg breakfast with the family watching TV and go to mass. Or on certain days, you would not eat fish. Uh, sorry, not eat meat, you'd have fish. Um, then in other traditions, you have Ramadan. Mm. You have Yom Kippur. In the Vedic or Hindu practices, we have a thing called tapas. And tapas is this diligent and disciplined process of willingly foregoing pleasure to have a deeper connection to God. Mm. Uh, tribal cultures, you'll see a lot of traditions where they will willingly surrender some so, sort of a pleasurable experience to recognize and deepen their connection to, to the universe, to nature, to higher self, to God. They'll have different names for it. Mm. But in our society, what we see is an incredible correlation between those practices that have that discipline and that willingness. Even meditation is a tapas. It's a willingness to forego my sensory pleasures to go within and connect to my higher self or God or stillness and silence. So that's again, another discipline. But when we correlate the traditions where there's a willingness to forego pleasure, we see greater levels of calmness, happiness, mm. and deeper connection. When we see the cultures where there's zero willingness to do that, and we just see this constant satiation of sensory pleasure, mm. we see incredible off the chart levels of unhappiness, anxiety, depression, uh, ADHD, you know, dependency on pharmaceutical drugs. It's, it's incredible to see those correlations. Yeah, it's like if you're surfing the peaks of the waves and you always go up and down, but whereas if you go to find mm -hmm. the stillness, the beauty in, in the deep ocean, it's different level of um, joy or happiness. Um, tell me about like your, I guess your early experience with meditation, because with most people, like, they may hear a lot about that meditation could be a way out to reduce anxiety or a lot of the issues or challenges they're facing and to gain clarity to, to even a, a higher peak of performance. But yet like for most people like, Hey, it's not working like thoughts going everywhere and it's, it's challenging and it doesn't seem like it's working or maybe the, the two three five ten minutes i'm meditating maybe i'm slightly calmer but like is it working is it not working like so a lot of these doubts crept in was it you had a good teacher or maybe it was kind of working for you at the beginning of what kept you going i think there's a couple things to take into consideration when we're exploring meditation um firstly it's what technique are you using because there's a very vast array of different meditation styles that we can use. And some of them are going to be very arduous and have very limited experience where you won't notice much of a difference. 
other techniques will be much more impacting. Now, when I did a lot of research in my very traditional way, I thought, okay, if I'm gonna do this, I wanna be all in and I wanna get the most out of it. So I did a lot of research prior to me learning into lots of different techniques. The one that I landed upon was one that had a lot of scientific research in that its validity as a technique to help with addictions, anxiety, depression, high blood pressure, cholesterol. It was incredible how much research was coming through from this technique. But also the one thing that really captivated me was this word that they used to describe it and it was called transcending. Now prior to me learning meditation, I was doing a lot of uh, recreational drug use and, and that was for the purpose of escaping my current experience and to transcend. I wanted to be in a rave culture with lots of music and flashing lights and lots of people feeling lots of love and, and have this euphoric experience. And that's what I was transcending my outer world reality to have this new experience. So that led to a lot of anxiety, depression and side effects. But when I heard this meditation called a transcending meditation or transcendental meditation, there was something that really captivated me with that. I love this idea of going beyond, which is what transcend means to go beyond. And I was curious as to what I was going to go beyond too. But when I started to meditate, this transcendent experience was so profound. Within the first week, I was noticing significant effects. And that's what I tend to find with my students is mm -hmm. that very quickly, they're going to have quite a transcendent experience. That's like, even in the first weekend, when I teach them, 99% of my students will go, wow, like, where did I just go? Like, what was that? Where That was profound. And so it might even be just glimpses into something, but to transcend means to go beyond our physical, mental, and emotional body. We identify with the world through those three vessels or vehicles, physical, mental, and emotional, and that's the I that we identify with. But in meditation, when we transcend that I, we access a fourth experience, which is in Sanskrit called Turiya, and that's the experience of me without an I. And that's this beautiful awareness of peace and calm but without a thinking and feeling body, which is quite unique. Mm, wow. So I'm definitely um, going to get more information from you on how do we people, how do other people get access um, to this uh, transcendental meditation. But we talked about early stages, even within a week, what people can expect from it. And you talked about this various form of meditation. So after you have your initial glimpse of there's more and you become an observer, like, is there a different quest that people can go on based on the inner calling? Or is there like a career path, which type of meditation I should choose? Like, what's the goal with that? Yeah, um, I, I do use various meditation techniques for different. I use uh, some checking on my chakras and I'll do a lot of root chakra meditation, which is expanding and grounding into my root chakra because we're very disconnected from our root. Uh, we have a very cerebral existence in our world where most of our energy and attention goes to our thinking mind. So I'd bring some awareness down into my roots. So that's one that I give to my students and I say to implement as well as the transcending meditation. There's things like opening your heart meditation. You know, we don't put a lot of attention on our heart. So I recommend to people, you know, there's a saying, yad babam tat babati, which means what we think we become. And if we think of our opening heart and this beautiful golden lovingness in our heart center, then we're going to have more love in our life. So that's another one that I recommend to people. But for me, until we have this experience of going beyond the thinking, feeling and physical body, we're going to be limited in our experience of life. We're going to live in some degree of ignorance of fundamental truth. And we all know of enlightenment. We've heard of that for many years now, but there's just not a lot of people accessing that field yet which is why we have so much suffering in the world. That field holds within it, that field of transcendence that is the unbounded formlessness of being, holds within it, at its subtlest level, all wisdom, all truth. And when we're operating purely from a condition-coded framework of thinking, then we're operating from a limited faculty that's really conditioned into us through genetics, through society programming, and through our upbringing. And so we're operating from a very limited framework. And now when we transcend and transcend and transcend, we start to incorporate a lot more wisdom into the way we operate in our lives. doesn't mean, again, we're perfect. I still make some stuff ups, but it does mean that we start to embody and infuse within us 
that absolute layer where all wisdom is embedded within. Also within that is the field of creativity. So all of creative potential lies in that field. So cognitions of creative impetus, creative ideas will come when we're in some of our most quietest moments, particularly in meditation, which surprised a lot of students. Like, oh my God, I got all these thoughts. It's like, yeah, it's a very dynamic experience because when we get out of our thinking mind, it's like the wave becoming the ocean. And in the ocean, the field of oceanic intelligence is all possibility and all creativity. Whatever's not designed and created, it lies within that field right now. Yeah, what's interesting is um, the best way to put it, but when you were speaking for the last like two or three minutes, like, you put me in a trance. And when you're speaking, the content is almost like blah, 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 blah. It was hard to focus on, but yet there's an underlying, I want to say um, meaning, but more so a feeling of what you're trying to send is pretty clear. And that's a trust that, like, Gary, you're running a podcast. You should know what you're about to say or ask. But there's a natural trust that the message will come through when it's about to to be my turn. Um, What you just described, I guess, meditation, a lot of the times that when we put a a word, a label on something, we're trying to like like keep it boxed into something like miniature size. But from what you just shared, it's very expansive, not in terms of like shopping, it's expensive, but it's huge. And it could be many things like meditation. It could be many states of meditative states. And with meditations, from what you said, using different forms and different types of meditation, you can also use it to harness or access certain things like you talk about, or people talk about like law of attraction, start manifesting things or, or using it to heal, using it to ground, using it to open heart. So that's, is that kind of true? Like, like many different things that people can do with Absolutely. meditation? Yeah. yeah. You know, they, they can get so much out of it in so many different ways and different techniques. Uh, you know, I started because I had anxiety and couldn't sleep and depression. You know, uh, many of my students generally come to me with an ailment that they want to treat. No, I don't think I've ever had a student come to me, I want an enlightenment. Mm. <laughs> it's something that it's just peeling back layers of the onion. You know, it's just slowly as they come to me with one particular disposition and you can try many different techniques to alleviate whatever that disposition is. Um, But what happens is it usually scratches an itch Ah. and then it's like opens up some level of inquiry and then it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So, um, and then they'll do their own research. They'll find other ways and they might try plant medicines or they might try Qigong as well as their meditation or they might do meditation and move on to something else. So it's not like meditation is... The goal, uh, just as plant medicine or anything else, it's giving us access to what's inherently already within us, but we just haven't realized it yet. We're unrealized. Yeah. And to self-realize is to realize the nature of the true self. And so meditation is just one of the gateways or portals or pathways that I think people can take to start to access that. Um, I think there's a multitude of different pathways that we can use. So it's really not about what's right or wrong. It's just about... Uh, you know, are you making uh, some movement in that direction yet or not? Yeah, yeah, that's great. After hearing that from you is is amazing. Like, I have a deeper appreciation or or deeper understanding. Like, I'm meditating, but as much as I'm learning from many great teachers, a lot of the times I feel like, hey, let's just trial and errors and, and see where this meditation brings me and have some fun and maybe have some feelings and, and maybe manifest some stuff. But hearing from you is like, maybe not an, an exact science, but there's a degree of framework around it, almost like a science that if you want to achieve certain states or, or different things in your life or cure, not cure, but maybe cure certain illness within you, there's certain modalities of, of meditation. And meditation doesn't have to be like close up. Mm, it could be like gardening. It could be washing dishes. But there's certain things that you can do, certain practice that can get you where you want. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I just always recommend to people, do your research on the technique of meditation and then do your research on the teacher that you want to resonate with. Because, you know, uh, some people will resonate with me as a teacher, but a lot of people will resonate with someone else as a teacher. They might be looking for a female teacher. They might be looking for someone that's less kind of corporate or someone that, you know, is in a different location. So there's two things, checking out what practice is resonating with you and within that practice, checking out which teachers are resonating with you. Because, uh, you know, we all got different frequencies and different nuances that means that some people will resonate more with others. And that's totally cool as well. Mm. 
Bro, I know you spend quite a bit of time like studying from the Vedic um, traditions amongst many things. How do you came across it? And I don't know a lot about the Vedics and for the listener, can you give a background? What is the Vedic, where they, they come from? Why are they so, to me, they're extremely wise um, mm. in their teachings. Um, yeah, can you just share sure. a bit? So Gary's talking about the Vedic knowledge and the Vedas. The so Vedic knowledge or Vedic wisdom is a body of knowledge that's been preserved, cognized, firstly cognized by seers that would transcend. So that was one of the key aspects of the Vedic practice was that there was this transcendent experience which would then give you the ability to access that field of wisdom. So it's not like oh, someone had a thought or read a book that gave them knowledge. It was something that they cognized through the field of infinite wisdom that's in the transcendent, that's in the formlessness of being. And what they cognized was uh, so much knowledge that literally is a pathway to fulfillment in our world today. And it was cognized up to, gosh, 10,000 years ago, some say. Um, the Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, these uh, the Upanishads were written thousands and thousands of years ago, which was the capturing of that knowledge into books. But the Vedic knowledge and the Vedas is a body of work that incorporates the recognition of the body and the different body types. So that's in Ayurveda. So Ayur means body and Veda is the knowledge. There's the Pachaveda, which is a particular way of building houses and buildings that is in congruency and in alignment with the universe and with nature. Oh. What we've not recognized, particularly as a human, is we've become very disconnected from our relationship with the universe and our relationship with nature, which is part of our biggest problem, I think, is that deep disconnect. And what they recognize in the Vedas is that we are actually part of an undercurrent of natural law. There's a beautiful flowing natural law, a current that is a sequential timeline that we're in. And we can be incongruent with that or we can be congruent with that. And when we're congruent with that, we find life flows a lot more fluidly and a lot more harmoniously. It's not perfect and you will definitely still have challenges, little snags along the way on the river that you get caught on. But when we let go more and trust and flow in that natural law, we find life is quite fluid and effortless. And what happens when we meditate with the Vedic practice is that we start to naturally by default through that transcendent experience be more congruent and in alignment with that natural law and less in our egoic structure that's moving us in and out of very irrelevant sort of pathways. So I came across it because it was a really interesting process that I came across it and it was beautifully organized by the universe in some beautiful natural law where I was in a very dark place. I was suffering from agoraphobia, so I'd left work. I couldn't go to work every day. I had too much anxiety and panic, and I'd seen doctors and psychiatrists and put on suicide watch. I had to report into the hospital at, at um, Prince of Wales at Randwick. And uh, I was at home, and this was in 1996. So agoraphobia in 1996 is uh, pretty monotonous because you don't have a phone, iPhone, and you don't have Netflix, and you don't have internet. So you watch free-to-air TV and I was watching a TV channel and they had a, a documentary about a property developer and the very small portion of that documentary showed him meditating. And it was phenomenal. Uh, no one in my life meditated. I, I grew up on a farm and I worked in finance in the late 80s, 90s. There was no one, there's no Calm and Headspace apps, so no one knew about meditation. And um, he talked very briefly about how he did this transcending meditation and he was wearing a suit because he's a property developer and a big businessman. And he was sitting in a chair like this with his hands on his knees. And they showed him meditating mm. in this room. And it was like this blinding epiphany. So firstly, they mentioned that word transcending. I was like, whoa, what's that? That sounds deep. And then they showed him in a suit, in a chair, not in robes, not with a head shaved, not in lotus. And like I wear suits, I sit in chairs. It, w it was just this bridge had been crossed where there was an accessibility there. And I remember distinctly getting the yellow pages out and opening the book up to M for meditation. If anyone's watching this and they're under 45, they have no idea what I'm talking about. The yellow pages is a book that we used to have that we would find businesses. And, uh, and I remember putting it on the coffee table and opening it to M for meditation. And I'm scrolling through the pages. I get to meditation and in the yellow pages, what you could do, you could pay a premium to either have your company highlighted in dark black in bold, but an even bigger premium if you had it in red. I don't know if you remember that, that there were some companies that would have theirs in red. And I remember in bright red came across on the page, transcendental meditation. 
and they had a f couple of phone numbers and that's when I rang to inquire about how I can uh, explore this technique and that's when it started. Okay, so they, the, the TM is actually from the faders. Mm -hmm. It's born out of, so Maharishi Mahesh Yogi is one of the representatives of that knowledge uh, many, many years ago. There's been thousands of sages and swamis and, uh, and saints that have continued to share that wonderful knowledge. Uh, he was just one that had taught my teacher and my teacher was an American that was living in Sydney. Yeah. And he would, had studied in Rishikesh uh, in India under the Maharishi had chosen to abide here in Sydney and that's where I was blessed to have learned that technique. Can you share some of the faders wisdom or practices for the most part in Western society you have no idea about? Hmm. It's so broad. It's a great question. Um, well, firstly, the one thing and the primary thing that they center all of it on is that when we operate from um, a thinking mind that's very deeply coded, we're operating from a, a limited capacity and what we have within us is access to an infinite field of creative intelligence and Einstein even calls this the unified field theory mm. and within that field is all wisdom and all creative potential so when we transcend beyond the framework of thinking and get into what's called being then we start to saturate our reality in that field and what happens is when we come out of that through our meditation, so the primary teaching of the Vedas is to transcend, to go into this field, mm. to get out of our physical, mental, and emotional body that we get so identified with, which is, which is a world of duality. When we transcend that, we access a field of unified field. So there's not two things, there's just one thing, this field of intelligence. And it's quite dynamic. And so when we do this on a regular basis, we start to infuse within us this experience and we become more and more of the embodiment of that and less and less of the personality and the ego that we've been coded and constructed to be. And so what happens is eventually there becomes, uh, over time, a greater degree of invincibility and profound blissfulness that we start to sustain within us because bliss is not an emotional reaction. Bliss is a sustained innate state, bliss, love and joy. So bliss, love and joy is the essence of being and emotions are anger, sadness, grief, shame, and they're reactive emotions that interrelate to the world. Mm. Okay, so when we want to free ourselves, that's moksha. So one of the teachings of the Vedic philosophy is this idea of moksha, M-O-K-S-H-A. So moksha is the freedom from the binding effect of life. So we have life, future, past and present that grips onto us and affects us. We're in this affected state where things affect us in a good way and things affect us in a bad way. We feel happy, we feel sad. That's the polarity, the peaks and troughs mm -hmm. of life. And we're at this surface level of reality, like the surface level of the ocean, that we're bobbing up and down. Things make us feel good, things make us feel bad. But if we transcend that layer of reality, and that's still there, so things still make me feel good and still make me feel bad. But if I transcend that, what happens is I start to get a full spectrum of reality, not a very thin layer of reality, that is still reality, that is still mm -hmm. part of the ocean. But as you mentioned beautifully, the, if we transcend that and go to the depths of the ocean, we also encompass and experience a stabilized state of fullness of reality, which is, yes, I have the ability to be affected and influenced by life. But however, there's a part of me that's deeper than that, that starts to experience something so rich and pure that uh, it's not affected by daily circumstances. Mm. Yeah, like I've, I've got glimpses into that. And I think there's certain practices like meditation as one of them that despite your external circumstances that it feels so real, but when you're in those like deeper state, it doesn't matter. Hmm. It doesn't matter hmm. like whether you've got bills to pay and you've got relationship issues or you just had a fight with someone. It just all fades away. It's just like, yeah, like those are surface issue. It doesn't bother you anymore. Yeah, look, it's, it's important we clarify. It doesn't mean you can skirt away from those realities. You know, I still have to grapple with daily demands and daily challenges what does help you is that you have greater capacity to a cognize a solution and adapt one of the things that causes so much suffering in our world is the inability to adapt to the circumstances and what we see particularly in the last 12 months is um, we see an increase in the need to be adaptive but diminished and limited capacity to adapt so our adaptive capacity has been maintained or reduced, 
yet our need to increase adaptive capacity has increased substantially. Oh, my business can't open its doors anymore. What do I do? My health is not the same. I couldn't go to a gym. You know, what do I do? So when we have increased need for adaptive capacity, but not an increase in adaptive capacity, that gap between the two increases stress and stress responses. So when we increase adaptive capacity, which is through this meditation and greater capacity to, to be intuitive and, and wise and cognitive to the daily demands, then what we find is as our adaptive capacity increases, our ability to take on the need for adaptive capacity increases as well. Mm. So when it comes down to conscious business, then what we find is, um, you know, Oprah Winfrey, who does this technique of meditation, says that it is only from that space can you create your best work and your best life. So that space mm -hmm. is the transcendent experience. Ray Dalio, the world's largest hedge fund manager, manages $180 billion worth of uh, assets. So his adaptive capacity is increasing all the time, but his ability to meet those demands, it means he can take on greater demands because his adaptive capacity is greater. And so you'll find that these people with greater adaptive capacity start taking on greater demands, which means they become greater, uh, more successful. Yeah, I think it, Ray talks about he meditates uh, on TM like, multiple times a day. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. So within the faders, do they talk about like, why this reality was created? Why are we here? Say it again, sorry. Why is this reality created? Or why are we here? What's the purpose of life? I thought that's what you said. That's such a good question. Mm. <laughs> okay, we're going to solve the uh, riddle of life right now. Um, it's something that we ponder, isn't it? Uh, why are we here? From a very high level perspective, from the Vedic perspective, from quantum physics and the study of the universe, we can start to realize in our limited capacity so far as far as our research goes into that, that world, that the universe manifests itself roughly around 14 billion years ago into form and phenomenon. So that's meteorites, amoebas, bacteria, fungi, humans, apple phones, solar systems, flowers, bees. Prior to that, there was what's perceived to be at this stage, pure perfection, pure divinity, pure energy, experiencing itself, experiencing itself, experiencing itself. And so what we have is the uh, recurring experience of perfection, having an ongoing experience of perfection, which is ultimately the most boring thing you could ever imagine. Perfection experiencing a perfection has nothing to experience other than that. And so for some reason, the perfection breaks its symmetry to create something that's perceived to be not itself, to perceive, to be perceived as something separate. Now it can experience amoebas and timeline. And in the Vedic philosophy, one of the understandings of these three layers of reality, which is the world of form that the universe manifests through the world of time, which is sequential periods that the, the sun is burning today, but in a, a period of time in the timeline, it won't be burning. And there was a period of time where it wasn't burning in the past as well. But for now, we're blessed to be in this wonderful junction point where we've captured a moment in time, a very brief moment in time, only a few billion years. I don't know how long the sun's been burning, but a very brief period of time where the sun is burning and we're looping around it, which is a, a jackpot in itself. And so we've got this timeline sequence of the universe, and then we've got this ultimate layer of the universe, which is the unmanifest. And so ultimately why we're here as a human being, the, the macro perspective is to realize that fundamental nature of reality, that mm. we're not the duality, we're not the form, we're not the phenomenon, and we're actually all of it experiencing itself, which is divinity having a playful experience. And this yeah. is called in Sanskrit, in the Vedic philosophy, Leela, L-I-L-A, -L -A, huh. the dance of the divine. But we lose that because we're in this uh, incredible state of forgetfulness. And so we have suffering because. We um, you, you reminded me on my first um, ayahuasca experience, like the journey I went on. It's like I experienced like I'm being the creator, like the perfection you talked about. And it's like, wow, this is like bliss, joy and love. And it's like, cool. Hmm. Let's go back down there to, yeah. to rescue more people who are getting a bit bored. I used the term exactly was bored. And not, not bored isn't boring, but something more flavorsome, sure. something more colorful, something to just more dynamics. Hmm. And went back down and then guide people back. 
And it's like so easy to come back. All I need to do is remember to breathe. And then like, but as soon as I get, I got down, it's exactly what you, well, it's kind of like what you described in the finance sector that you thought you're just going to go in for a short time. Mm. I thought I was just going to go down. I know how to get back up. It's like, whoa, I'm getting lost. Like, whoa, how do I get back? And then and I suddenly remember, I'm back. And it's like, let's go back down again. Eventually got to a point that, well, they are me. Like, I don't need to rescue them. They are like me. They're all powerful in their own right. It definitely like gave me a, a glimpse of like where we came from. Um, what I wanted to also ask you is recently I've, I've a, a bit more into the meditation and studying the craft of it. Um, how important do you think it is to decalcify your pineal gland or people call it the third eye? Mm. Yeah, we have a capacity to cognize, intuit, have psychic capacities and deeply profound intuitive capacities. And it usually flows through this region of the mind, um, which is why we talk about the third eye and things like that. I'm not scientific and I'm limited in my capacity to, to speak on this. From what I have heard and from what I've seen so far is that uh, things like fluoride can calcify the pineal gland and that what it means that hardens it and blocks it and creates some blocking thing. Um, there are different practices we can do to help open up that pineal gland and open up that capacity to really tune in and cognize and, and almost like have psychic capabilities and um, be guided through that intuition. Um, we have intuition being guided through the pineal gland. We have intuition being guided through lower chakras as well. Oh, wow. So, um, and that's, we talk about gut feel. Mm. Uh, and the heart guides us as well. It's the guts, the heart is guiding us a lot through life into moving towards greater joy and greater fulfillment. Um, quite often what we have happening is that because we've given so much attention to our thinking mind, that those guidance systems, our gut, our heart, and our third eye um, are very closed. And so that's why we make a lot of poor decisions because we're making decisions from a coded thinking mind that's conditioned to think in a particular way. We call this a vasana. Vasanas, V-A-S-A-N-A-S, are these habitual patterns of thinking in our mind that just continue looping over and over again. And mm -hmm. so opening up the third eye is uh, opening up the pituitary gland is, is a very important part of uh, awakening. Mm. Yeah, I, I found that um, the people that has the like, greatest psychic power like I only started seeing this pattern probably a few weeks ago. They seem to, for whatever the reason, stop drinking tap water for mm. quite some time, stop using um, fluoride toothpaste. Mm. And for whatever reason, they started like having um, spirulina, chlorella, whatever, that sometimes they don't even know. It just feels like it's natural for them. So I just came to a conclusion, like those stuff like really um, that we're not aware of, um, the environment really like helps to calcify it and, and, and shut down our, our third eye and there's probably stuff that, that's happening in our environment that shut down our hearts and our guts as well. We live in a, a very toxic world. We don't realize. We just kind of normalize to where we're at. We just think it's normal that, you know, 40% of people are on pharmaceutical drugs of some sort or we've got all sorts of ailments and, and we just think it's normal that we spray our deodorant under our arms and we have toothpaste in our mouth and we put shampoo on our head and we use soap on our hands and we put hand gels on our hands and we have Wi-Fi all around us and 3G, 4G, 5G. You know, we've just normalized to living in a very toxic environment and we've normalized being sick and unhealthy. We've normalized to being anxious and depressed. We've normalized having hospitals full. We've normalized to 15 year old kids is being medicated. And we've forgotten what it is to live simply, cleanly, in a very healthy and joyful light way. Because society is deeply conditioned and coded to be unhappy and unhealthy. And we kind of get swept along that current and go with that flow. So most of the things that we look at in our day, so the dishwashing liquid that we wash our plates and bowls in, the shampoo that we put on our head, the toothpaste we put in our mouth, the deodorant we spray under our arm every day. It's such a porous area under our arm. Um, for me, I use a salt stick and I haven't used a deodorant for probably 20 years now. Um, my, I kind of have a running joke. It's going to sound a bit gross in their house that I can wear t-shirts for four days. They don't smell. And the reason being is because it's the bacteria that is pungent and when we put salt sticks it neutralizes that mm. and so 
spraying toxic aluminium and other all sorts of things in those sprays is really detrimental to our well-being. And we're, we're seeing huge changes in our biochemistry. We're seeing huge change in our hormone makeup, huge changes in our, obviously, cancer and everything like that. So it's really simple, but we're just not addressing those fundamental things. And it doesn't mean we have to spend money on things to make a difference. It actually means spending less money on a lot of things. Mm. Well, I know that you've spent a lot of years and there's a lot of uh, time, energy, and, and resources put towards building up your, your film, The Portal. Um, I've watched it. It's a, it's a fantastic film, and, and you're doing a worldwide launch soon. Can you tell us more about what was the idea behind the project? Mm, yeah. Um, you know, I, I had such a big passion to make a difference in the world with, with inspiring people to meditate. And uh, it was interesting. I was quite affected by The Secret. Uh, when it came out, it was kind of quite groundbreaking. It was one of the very first documentaries that addressed things for our own development. You know, it was one of the very early documentaries that addressed personal development. You know, there was documentaries on ants and beetles and oceans. But when there was one that could impact us and personally change our life, it was very unique. And I remember sitting there in this group watching it. I was going, I was so affected. And what they managed to do, it just became a huge success, the book and the film. They managed to take a very esoteric subject, the law of attraction. I mean, this is kind of out there, right? That you think and feel something and it can start coming towards you. It was like crazy stuff, right? When you break it down. But they managed to infiltrate the masses. It was phenomenal how they infiltrated the masses and it was a huge success. And I was really inspired by that. And uh, another mate of mine, we collaborated together to start this project to, to make a film that would have the same sort of magnitude and effect on two levels, I won't kid you. you know, we thought commercially it'd be a great idea. And secondly, we thought it would be something that could really make a difference in the world. And I thought film is a great medium to tell story. And so we set about to make a film that we always had a very early premise that the film was to be something very unique and very moving. I didn't want a documentary that just had information and data. You can get that from Google these days. So it was one that would showcase stories that were moving and inspiring and sad and rich and colorful and gave you an insight into human life and how crisis is part of our experience of evolution. Crisis is part of our evolutionary process. And I wanted to sort of use my story, how not that my story is in there, but just that, that crisis was my greatest time in evolution where it guided me like that, you know, kind, loving parent that's not always nice to, to move you in a space that is going to bring you back into path. And so I wanted to make a film that would do that. And so it's been a long time coming. It's been one of the toughest things I've done, uh, having huge responsibilities with our investors and, and everything to complete this. It's something that I, I didn't expect to be such a massive undertaking. Um, Within that, you also had a lot of learning experiences. Yeah, it's been one of my greatest teachers. It's taught me so many things. One of the greatest things I think it's taught me is humility. Um, it's kind of done a good job of beating a lot of my ego out uh, there's still plenty to go but it's been really a humbling experience which i think was obviously what the universe needed to give me again <laughs> mm. so yeah it's coming out very soon and we're excited to launch the film uh, out to the world and we're doing it in a way not only did we want to make a film that was very unique and <clears throat> we we were blessed to have a wonderful director jackie pfeiffer who co-produced and co-wrote it with me um come onto the project and she was an ex-DJ from Ibiza. She's Australian, but was DJing in Ibiza for seven years and had spent some time in the Australian film industry. But she brought a, such a uniqueness to the creation of the film that I could never have conceived myself. So this incredible unique way of making film, but we also want to have a very unique way of releasing the film. And we looked at different traditional pathways, which is, you know, going into your streaming platforms and going into your cinemas and going into distribution agents. But None of them really stacked up on two levels. One is financially and B on that virality capacity. So we've gone down a path where people can join us as partners and they become part of our community. And we all are part of this together to get this out to the world. And as a partner, we're sharing 50% of the revenue, which is really exciting. So we've got a number of partners starting to flood in and start to register and start to be part of this movement where they, it's like, yeah, I'd love to be a partner. I've got one woman yesterday, I was talking to me yesterday. She goes, I want to make a million dollars and get 10 million people in Mexico to watch your film. So I'm like, well, you're this, the best partner we could possibly ever ask for. We're happy to give you a million dollars if that's what happens through your endeavors. 
Mm, that's great. So how do people like, join this movement? And they can go to the website, um, enter the portal. When we launch it, there'll be... Uh, Entertheportal.com? Sorry, entertheportal.com, yeah. Um, they'll be able to pre-order. And they'll be able to see the trailer. And um, there'll be partner registration pages that they can uh, register as a partner, which will be going out pretty soon. Fantastic. And if people want to contact you, like do you do like private coaching retreats and stuff? Yeah, a big thing that I do is retreats. It's one of the most impacting thing that I can do as far as changing someone's life. That five-day, six-day experience is so powerful. It's, it's such an incredible reset. So I'm doing a lot more retreats, which is the, the area that I love. Um, we've done three retreats in the last five months. We're blessed in Australia, we can run retreats, so that's a, a blessing. And um, we usually have Bali, we've got one lined up for Greece and Dubai and possibly uh, the Philippines as well. But because of COVID, we can't do the overseas one, so we're just keeping them all in Australia. And we're just going to announce tomorrow our new Byron Bay retreat, so that'll be live by the time this comes out. Um, and that's in October. So retreats and then a lot of coaching. So a big part of what I do is group coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is working with people that really want to accelerate their message in the world and their capacity to make an impact, to mm. help them use the platforms, the messaging, the marketing and the mm. mindset to help them kind of get out of their way and help them to express that full potential that's wanting to come through them. How does group coaching actually work? Um, so what we do is we meet every two weeks. It's called the Zen Academy for Transformational Leadership. And it's a really beautiful group of very conscious leaders that just, A, want community. So there's a private Facebook group and there's live Q&A calls where I'll either have a theme that I'll bring that I'll have cognized that week or two that might be relevant for the group that will really help them start to see things in a unique way that they might not be able to see. And then there's some pre-recorded um, modules that they get to watch on conscious leadership as well. Mm. A lot of Vedic philosophies in there. Yeah, and they go to tomcronin.com. Yeah, it's all at tomcronin.com, the film and the coaching and everything. There. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing all your wisdom today. And I, I have a deeper appreciation for meditation and, and more importantly, know how to utilize it to its benefit. I'll definitely uh, tap you on the shoulders to say, hey, I want to do this. Like, what, like mm -hmm. what form of meditation should I do? So thank you so much, brother.